In the headlines this evening, Korea's finance ministry lowers its growth forecast by 0.2 percentage points to 3.8 percent, but that's still higher than the projections from global investment banks. In-depth analysis coming up. Local authorities investigating the recent document leak of Korea's nuclear power plant operators say they are still open to all possibilities, ranging from an inside job to a North Korean hack attack. And Washington says North Korea may make it back to its terror watch list, while Pyongyang threatens to retaliate. These stories and more just ahead. Very good to have you with us. This is Early Edition at 6 from our studio in Seoul. I'm Nahyun Gyal. And I'm Daniel Che. Thank you for joining us. In light of the recent cyber attack on Sony Pictures, U.S. President Barack Obama is considering putting North Korea back on Washington's terror watch list. Well, he described the hacking incident not as an act of war, but as an act of cyber vandalism. For our top story, here's Connie Lee. Do you think this was an act of war by North Korea? U.S. President Barack Obama says no, he doesn't think so. But he did call the North Korean-linked cyber attack on Sony Pictures an act of cyber vandalism. No, I don't think it was an act of war. I think it was an act of cyber vandalism that was very costly, very expensive. Speaking on CNN's State of the Union with Candy Crowley, President Obama emphasized his earlier stance that the U.S. will take action and respond accordingly to this hack attack against the movie The Interview. It was last month when Sony Pictures suffered a massive cyber attack by hackers who demanded the studio's comedy film on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un not be released. This prompted Sony to cancel its Christmas Day release amid fear of more threats. The FBI linked the hacking to North Korea on Saturday, but the communist state continues to deny any involvement. President Obama, however, is considering redesignating North Korea as a state that sponsors terrorism. We've got to work with the private sector, and the private sector has to work together to harden their sites. But in the meantime, when there's a breach, we have to go after the wrongdoer. He also called on Congress to pass a cybersecurity law to protect private sectors in the U.S. So will the interview ever be released? A lawyer for Sony Pictures speaking to NBC's Meet the Press on Sunday did say that the film will be distributed, but in what format is still unknown. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And we, as we said earlier, North Korea has been denying any involvement in the hacking attack since the beginning and is now outraged by the U.S. accusation. The regime has released a strong statement vowing to retaliate against Washington. Shin Tae-min has more on Pyongyang's reaction. North Korea isn't just denying a hand in the cyber attack on Sony Pictures. They're threatening to retaliate for the mere suggestion that they were involved. In a statement posted Sunday, Pyongyang's National Defense Commission said it fully stands in confrontation with Washington in all war spaces, including the one on the web. The statement even threatens to blow up the White House, the Pentagon, and all of the U.S. mainland if President Barack Obama retaliates over the last month's Sony cyber hack. As for who was responsible for carrying out the attack on Sony, which set off a series of events that led to the theatrical release of the interview being canceled, the North Korean regime said they had clear evidence that the Obama administration was involved in making the film. They also stressed again that the hackers worked on their own. The statement says they don't know who or where the hackers are, but praise their attack as a righteous action and that they're supporters and sympathizers of the North. South Korea didn't escape blame in the statement. The regime said it had never carried out a single hacking attack and that all cyber attack related incidents were orchestrated by Seoul. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Well, China opposes all forms of cyber attacks and cyber terrorism. 
This is what Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi told U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry during a phone call on Sunday. He, however, made no direct mention of North Korea during their conversation, which included the Sony hack attack. Now, Washington had previously sought Beijing's help in reining in North Korean hackers since China is a key provider of North Korea's internet access. The Chinese government hasn't responded to that request as of yet. North Korea is known to operate an elite unit of unit rather of 3,000 cyber experts. We shift our focus back to South Korea, where another cyber attack is also making headlines here domestically. A hacker who has claimed responsibility for leaking documents that belong to the country's nuclear power company says he is not done yet. The state-run firm assures the public everything is under control, but the hacker is threatening to release a trove of other information if his demands are not met by Thursday. For the latest, we turn to our Connie Kim. A two-day-long cybersecurity drill has begun at all of Korea's nuclear facilities in light of the recent leak of sensitive information. The Energy Ministry will work with various agencies, such as the Nuclear Safety and Security Commission, to make sure all are safe from any potential cyber attacks. Over the two-day period, the Ministry will make sure that power plants are not susceptible to future hack attacks, but experts say not enough is being done. It is going to take time and money, but the nuclear reactor's operating system should be established again from scratch. Updates aren't a long-term solution. Hackers could still shut down power at the reactor from outside. The unidentified hacker leaked more information about the facilities over the weekend and threatened more leaks if the government does not shut down some of its reactors by Christmas Day. The freshly leaked data includes floor maps, operation manuals and safety reports from the state-run Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power Company and information on the Kori-2 and Warsan-1 reactors. While authorities say the information released until now poses no threat, the hackers are threatening to release tens of thousands of pages of new data, including blueprints and other classified information. The investigation team says that the attack was well-planned. They say the registration information the hacker used to set up a blog detailing the attack was stolen and that the Twitter ID he or she used was registered in the U.S. Korean investigators have requested assistance from the FBI in the probe. They haven't ruled out North Korea's involvement, with some of the malware code discovered similar to that in previous North Korean attacks. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Unified Progressive Party lawmakers are stripped of their parliamentary seats following the Constitutional Court's historic decision last week to disband the party. The party seats at the provincial level will also be taken away. Five UPP lawmakers have vowed to take legal action. Our Kim Young gil has more. The National Election Commission decided on Monday to strip six members of the now disbanded Unified Progressive Party from their seats in provincial legislatures. The six who were appointed under the proportional representation system said the decision was invalid because election law dictates that seats may be taken away only when members break away from the party. They plan to file an injunction. Last Friday, the Constitutional Court ordered the dissolution of the UPP and five of its lawmakers lost their seats in the National Assembly. After that, political watchers had expected that the six members in post at the provincial level would also lose their seats. All five of the UPP sitting lawmakers that were kicked out of the National Assembly last week have said they will file a lawsuit against the state. They claim the Constitutional Court does not have the right to remove them from the legislature as there's no law that stipulates the status of lawmakers in a case where a party is dissolved. Last Friday's ruling comes more than 400 days after the Justice Ministry filed a petition following the arrest of a number of UPP members on rebellion and conspiracy charges. Several UPP members, including former lawmaker Lee seok were convicted of plotting to overthrow the government in the event of war with North Korea. Kim young Arirang News.
The finance ministry will maintain its expansionary policy for the new year, trying to step out of a sluggish economic recovery. Well, the government revised its growth forecast for next year as well, while introducing comprehensive structural reform measures for the coming year. Arirang's Hwang Ji-hae breaks it down for us. The finance ministry on Monday lowered its 2014 growth outlook to 3.4 percent and that of next year's to 3.8 percent, citing still sluggish domestic demand. To pull the economy out of its low growth rut, the government's economy management plan for next year will put emphasis on structural reforms while maintaining its expansionary policy. Structural changes will focus on the labor, education, financial and public sectors so that human resources and money, which are an economy's key elements, can be distributed efficiently. The government will seek ways to raise the female labor participation and better utilize the foreign workforce, while educational reform will place emphasis on enhancing vocational training. It plans to promote apprenticeship programs where students in college or in vocational schools can receive training directly from related companies. The government will cut red tape in the financial sector and promote the use of IT at banks and other financial institutions to foster the so-called fintech. Under the government plan, policymakers will also tackle pressing risks head-on. One major task is diffusing threats posed by snowballing household debt. The government will use a state housing fund to switch roughly $35 billion of short-term loans, carrying floating rates into longer-term fixed-rate loans. For the corporate sector, the government will introduce new measures to speed up the debt restructuring process. The move will allow troubled companies to begin workout programs before their financial health becomes irreparable. And through the structural changes, the government aims to lay the groundwork for sustainable economic growth, hopefully making 2015 a turning point for regaining economic vitality. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. And we have invited an expert to talk more about this issue today. Yes, we have Professor Yang jun Suk from the Catholic University of Korea, one of our favorite speakers, joining us in the studio. Thanks very much for coming in today, Professor. Happy to be here. Okay, so the government today rolled out various measures, structural reforms mostly, and ranging from restructuring debt yeah. to inducing corporate investment. So what was your first reaction today when you saw that in terms of feasibility, I guess? Okay, well, in terms of, fees in terms of the plan itself, I was not noticed that... Uh, it deals mostly with long-term structural plans. Uh, that's what the government said. Mm -hmm. Right now, people are more interested, I think, in the economic recovery from the recession. But I think this was a brave move on their part to talk, uh, talk about the long-term structural reforms. Having said that, uh, I think there is a wide variety of policies that they mentioned, some of it with very f little connection with each other. If there's a commonality, I think they're targeting uh, businesses and job creation. I'm not quite sure if that's the most effective way of going about the uh, rec uh, recovery, mm -hmm. uh, but I think this is a uh, type of policy that Korea needs in the long run. Uh, so, uh, I think this will be good for the long run, but not necessarily for the next couple of years. I don't think you'll see much of an effect from this in, say, the next six months or a year. Hmm. Right, having your chin up and staying positive, I say it's really important, but for the Korean government, uh, we have economic growth forecast for 2015, a bit lower, but still above average, especially compared to projections by global uh, investment banks. Uh, are we being too hopeful? Well, there's always been a problem with uh, government numbers. Uh, do, when they announce these numbers, is it a estimate, a projection, or is it a target? Mm -hmm. And uh, government itself has been making these projections for the last uh, 30 years, and they've always been sort of iffy on whether it's a projection or a target. Uh, but I think right now there is actually a need for the government to be a bit more optimistic. Uh, because right now we have very low consumption, very low investment, and I think the major factor behind that is low consumer confidence, low business confidence. So when everybody else is giving some bad news, I think having the government give uh, not necessarily falsely good news, but optimistic news is probably useful. Mm -hmm. So the government aims to have a better balance between one of the things that they that, that it said today was to have a balance between or have a better balance between 
uh, boosting domestic demand and exports. So do you think this uh, vision is viable? I think it's another thing that Korea needs to go on the long run. Korea traditionally had relatively low consumption to GDP ratio compared to other countries and even now we have a relatively low rate compared to say countries like US or even Hong Kong. Uh, that is a uh, legacy of our development policy where we use uh, low consumption and high savings to fuel investment and exports but right now the export markets are iffy. Uh, not only is there a global recession, but there's other players coming up like China and India. And uh, I, before, Korea was a very small country, but now uh, we have large companies. We're a fairly large economy globally. But the market is still pretty small. The market no? itself is pretty small, but co uh, companies like Samsung or Hyundai have now become major global players. Mm. So it's not a matter of small company going into a foreign market, but a, a company which can be part of the global oligopoly. And that means they, they are considering future possible profits, uh, future uh, uh, profit opportunities, uh, the size of the market, how it will be affected. It's not just a matter of if we make it, they will buy it. Hmm. Uh, they have to consider the uh, future projections. And given that, I think uh, more uh, emphasis toward consumption is, pro uh, is necessary in the long run. Again, this is not probably not going to be very helpful for Korea for the next six months or a year because you can't make that type of change very quickly. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, it's, some, uh, it's a definitely something that Korea needs to move into. Mm -hmm. Well, we are, of course, uh, very confident and very good at pulling up our socks and really putting up a good fight when or when we are not having our backs to the wall. That's Korea for you. Uh, but, of course, the important thing is direction and where and how and why and we, how we should channel our energy. Uh, we had various structural reforms mentioned by the government. In your opinion, Professor, uh, where do you think the Korean government should put most emphasis on? Okay, there's one thing that I have a slight disagreement on with this plan. Uh, this plan very, uh, emphasizes the supply side a lot. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really talk about that much about the demand side. I think demand side is, uh, we need some emphasis on demand side to recover from the current recession. But also, uh, I think the next uh, few decades are going to be very uh, unstable. It's going to be, uh, require a lot of changes, uh, not only in Korea, but also because of changes in global economy. So I would have preferred perhaps a stronger welfare policy so that people who are uh, uh, affected by these changes can weather um, their problems more smoothly. And I think that will help to boost consumption, which is actually a key to this whole problem. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you very much, Professor, for joining us today and uh, sharing your insights. Consumption is the key, and you believe that's where the government should really be putting their emphasis on. Well, I think if you have a stronger safety net, then it will allow people to consume more, but also it will allow structural changes to take place more easily. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we see in Korea that if there's a change that requires people to be let go of from a job, they resist a lot, bec partially because we don't have a very good safety net. So I think when we have a good safety net, it will make the adjustment toward the newer industries, the more profitable industries, uh, more uh, easier so that Korea can have a more smoother uh, growth path. Okay, Professor Yang joo thank you so much for coming in and helping to broaden our horizons again. We look forward to having you back here soon. Thank you. Ask any Seoulite what the capital's biggest fashion hub is, most likely the answer will be Dongdaemun fashion town, right? Right, and it feels like you're in a foreign land once you're there these days because you hear so many different languages. Right, so many, many visitors. There, right, on business or pleasure. And uh, with foreign tourists flooding into the shopping center every year, its presence is rapidly expanding into overseas markets as well. Our Park ji has this week's industry insight. You can't talk about Korea's fashion industry without mentioning the Dongdaemun fashion market. Dongdaemun fashion town is the largest clothing market in Korea, and about one-third of all Korea's clothing distributors are based near the region. From textiles and clothing subsidiary materials to sewing factories and wholesale and retail shops, if it has to do with clothing and fashion, you will find it here. A designer's idea can be made into a final product in just a day. Let's take a look. 
This is Dongdaemun Fashion Town, the location of more than 30 fashion malls and tens of thousands of small clothing shops. It's really amazing, all the districts, all the fashion, it's really nice. I sometimes see items with unique designs that I cannot find at brand or department stores. Retail shops are open from midnight or 2 a.m., and wholesale shops open from 8 p.m. to the next morning, meaning the market operates 24 hours a day. What's peculiar to the district is that it's like a complete fashion ecosystem where everything about fashion is clustered together. Thousands of fabric and clothing subsidiary shops and more than 20,000 small sewing factories are all nearby. Designers can turn their ideas into clothes in just a day by making a sample. And once the design is confirmed, mass production can start after another day or two. With Dong Demun's best yet sophisticated designs gaining global recognition, many orders now come from abroad. Now we get many sample making orders from China as Chinese buyers visit Dong Demun often. The Dong Demun district makes more money from exports than domestic sales especially in the wholesale market. Roughly 60 percent of the town's annual revenue comes from exports. International buyers are mostly from China, Taiwan and Japan. The fashion town also serves as a test bed for many up-and-coming designers. Here's a hip fashion mecca where you can make and sell clothes. The region helps in my market research and market sourcing. Some designers have successfully grown from single shops to fashion empires. This modern brand began from a shop in Dongdaemun, but has expanded to include dozens of shops in China. Codis Combined started as a shop in Dongdaemun in 2002. Now we have many products in many categories, particularly menswear, underwear, and a kid's clothing line. Fashion group Hyungji, which is the number one market share in women's clothes as a domestic company, also started as a humble shop in Dongdaemun Market in the early 1980s. The founder of the group still emphasizes the so-called Dongdaemun spirit, which is characterized by designs that are ahead of their time in order to survive the fierce competition, thorough product management and affordable prices. The Dongdaemun fashion market has served as a breeding ground for clothing businesses and designers ever since the end of Korean War. Thanks to the market's unique features and its vibrant energy, Korea's leading fashion hub now attracts millions of people from both inside and outside of the country. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. The day that all couples look forward to and all singles or solos dread is coming soon. Uh, Christmas, Christmas is around day, the corner yes. and the uh, frigid weather has kind of subsided. Well, let's see if we can expect a warm up as we head into Christmas by uh, turning to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. Well, good evening, guys. Currently, most of the snow has stopped, except in Chungcheongnam, the province, where it's falling sporadically due to the snow clouds that are moving in from the west. Now, today is also Dongji here in Korea, or the winter sol uh, solstice, which marks the shortest day of the year, and the sun already has set about an hour ago at 5.18 p.m. Korea time, and we've already started a period of 14 hours of darkness. Now, after today, as the sun comes back out, now warmer temperatures are expected as well, with the highs above the freezing. And although uh, also, along with that, cloudy skies are expected nationwide tomorrow and throughout the rest of the week. And no precipitation is in the forecast, so we won't be expecting any white Christmas this year. Now to our readings for tomorrow. So we'll start off the Tuesday morning at negative 4 and gets up to 5 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will top out at 8 and 9 degrees. And moving over to other regions such as Jeju, Wale and Dokdo will be mild at uh, 10 and 8 degrees, while Mount Kungang will be lower at negative 3. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park, and I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. 
So book your flight early if you want a white Christmas outside of Korea, <laughs> I presume. Well, that's all we have for you at this hour. Thank you so much for staying with us. To our viewers in different time zones, do have a wonderful day. This has been Daniel Chen. And I'm Nai Hyun Gyung. If you're tuning in from Korea, have a great evening. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.